Right, we are thrilled, ladies and gentlemen, to have with us uh, uh, actually a house full of people today. Uh, Bob Seidenschwartz joining us this morning, along with guests, of course, John King, our uh, show producer, uh, the Montana World Affairs Council on the radio. And today we are delighted to have Karen Adams, the super forecaster, we like to call her. Hello, nice to be back. How are you? Great. All right, great. And, and you brought a special guest with you, Obashek Chatterjee, a political science professor at the University of Montana. How are you, sir? Good. Hello. How are you? It's a pleasure to meet you. All right, so so uh, now, Bob, you're over there, aren't you? I can't see you. Yes, of he's uh, tall. good I morning, can, Peter. I can see the top of and his good forehead. Good morning, welcome to our guest. Good to see you guys. <laughs> now, Bob, what, what's it all about today, sir? Oh, you know, look, all, all the shows are special, but some days I just get a little bit more excited when I have, uh, well, Karen's <laughs> been on the show before, and uh, Obashek. So this is going to be a, a very broad-based, but very insightful, in-depth discussion on geopolitical issues and um, economics, government, um, Who's winning and who's losing? Uh, how do you look at this? What are the different types of assessments that we have? So, you know, let's let's start with kind of that 30,000-foot overview and let Karen uh, just give a little bit of assessment in terms of what are some of the countries right now that are on the rise? All right. And as a result of being on the rise, what are some of the specifics behind that that are lending itself? All right. Well, you know I am a forecaster, and I've told you my secrets about forecasting before. 80% chance of rain today, right? Uh, yeah. You know, I was going to say... <laughs> I'd say maybe 100% Agreed. right now, yeah. <laughs> so so you yeah, forecast know, after the fact, do you? Wow, you with another one now. <laughs> so hold on. Uh, so I ha- am um, finishing an article this week that says not that China is going to rise, but that China has become a great power. China now has the capabilities to match the United States across an array of capabilities, not one for one. You know, it certainly hasn't matched the U.S. in terms of every uh, military capability or every economic capability. But China now has enough capabilities, and in particular enough economic capabilities, to stand on its own uh, with regard to American sanctions. And that means that the U.S. is going to have to take the uh, the Chinese wishes uh, more seriously into consideration. Now, please forgive me for being the ignorant one in the group, and that's usually my role here. So what sanctions – are there currently sanctions against China because of – some uh, human rights violations that are that are going on or what? Uh, no, there aren't any big sanctions against China right now. Okay. This is more about the possibility that China could, could be uh, above could, all that. Could right. levy sanctions reciprocally on the U.S. now. Wow. Yeah, and this is as a result of some um, some currency deals that it has made with major U.S. trading partners. Uh, the EU is now China's largest trading partner, and China has uh, concluded in the last six months a currency swap deal with the EU, which means that they could continue to trade without dollars if the U.S. sanctions China for some sort of, for example, military excursion. And um, China has also, in the last several months, concluded a deal like that with with Canada, which is the U.S.'s largest trading partner. So this is still potential power. You know, China and the U.S. are major trading partners. It would not be in either the U.S.'s or China's interest to actually go down that path. It but it gives, yeah. it gives China the capability yeah. to be heard in a more serious way. It, it signals a shift, though, in what has been a dominant scenario for the U.S. in terms of the dollar. Right. Since World War II. Right. And I've been paying close attention to this because you read articles and hear about this. So give us some of the implications of what this means, though, in terms of U.S. relations, not just with China, but with trading partners like the EU for the U.S. Uh, uh, China is heavily involved in the Middle East in a number of countries with Iran. Right. And there's shifts that are taking place. So. Give us a little insight into what that may mean for us. Yeah, we're not the only game in town anymore, basically. Right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Now, China still would like to be very much involved in the U.S. market. I want to. I want to underscore that. And it's really not in China's interest to to go down a path of conflict with the U.S. So there's a lot of attention now, for example, on Chinese building up islands in the South China Sea. Does that mean it's going to try to take over more territory? What's going to happen to Taiwan? That sort of thing. But I think the real action is really much more economic because China needs to keep growing domestically to maintain its domestic stability. So um, so I think that the more important implications are sort of in the dip- diplomatic realm. Mm-hmm. That when the, when the China says, you know, we'd really like the Saudis to stop bombing in Yemen, that the, the, the Saudis and the Americans are going to listen they more have, carefully. They have gravitas That's now. right. That's right. right. Something they've really, you know, they, they've had sheer numbers before, but they haven't had this kind of political power mm-hmm. before, right? Right. Uh-huh. Okay. Now, uh, 
preventing any twilight struggle between the U.S. and China. Uh, you know, a lot of people think about uh, the world in terms of the Cold War, uh, what we call the bipolar world back then, and the aftermath where the U- U.S. kind of rose for quite a long time as, uh, well, until today, uh, apparently now there's a bipolar world again. That's right. Now, you had mentioned that it was bipolar because of currency tr- deals that China had made with partners. Mm-hmm. So who are these partners? What does the Team China look like? that balances out the United States, in right. your opinion? You know, I think we, this is one of the challenges I've had in writing this piece. It's called Back to Bipolarity. And it makes it sound like we're going back to the Cold War, doesn't it? It, it conjures up these ideas of the Eastern Bloc and the Western Bloc and never the twain shall meet. And I just don't think it's going to work that way. Because as I've mentioned, China's largest trading partner is the EU, which is a major trading partner of the U.S. And our trading par- our major trading partner, Canada, is also a major trading partner of of China. So the world is extremely interrelated now as a result of all the globalization that happened after the Soviet Union fell apart. Um, so it's not going to look like the tight, tightly bound alliances. It's going to be more like coalitions of the willing, you know, to coin a term. Ha ha. Uh, that's right. And, um, and I think we've seen already just in the last month with China putting together its new infrastructure bank, the way that that can work on a particular issue. Uh, c- countries that usually we kind of take for granted lined up behind China. Uh, to to promote new economic deals to promote growth worldwide. One of the things that Bob is constantly talking about uh, on this show, whenever we talk about e- economic <laughs> issues, grab that microphone, Bob. Pretty much, it, it's all about uh, uh, what's what's best. It basically economic self interest, right? And isn't that what these countries are doing right now, Bob? Yeah, I don't think there's a country on the uh, face of the earth that, first of all, their nationalistic and economic interests come first. How do they form relationships and alliances to further those, in, further those interests at the same time maintaining good relations on the fringes is one of the challenges. And, you know, Karen mentioned something about China. China's going from an export economy, and still will be, to more of a consumptive economy internally. And I'd like uh, Obashek to kind of comment a little bit on when a country is going through transitions like this. This has implications both from a political standpoint and an economic standpoint. And anybody paying attention here, China has banking issues, has real estate bubbles. So there's some internal situations when we come back from the break that we'll have Obashek comment. Good on. job, Bob. You caught the signal. <laughs> I didn't have to throw thing, a pencil at him or anything. So <laughs> Sometimes I hit him in the head and it's really bad. Yeah. 721-1290 is our number. By the way, we have all three lines open. Fascinating discussion about the world economy while it's raining outside in Missoula. Hey, I want you to join in the conversation. We'd love to have you at 721-1290 or on our Facebook page. We'll be right back. Hey, it's really coming down out there. 721-1290 is our number, 1-800-568-5309. Also on our Facebook page, KGVO. And uh, right now joining us in studio, Karen Adams. Of course, we have Bob Seidenschwartz and Obashek Chatterjee, who's a political science professor. Now, you just addressed a question. Could you kind of re- restate that for us, Bob, so we can get back on track? Yeah, we were, uh, you had asked about uh, countries and their national or self-interest. And uh, I'd like uh, Obashek to kind of address that a little bit in terms of what does that actually mean okay. and kind of distill this down for us a bit here. Um, yeah. So, you know, we think of countries having self-interest, um, economic self-interest, etc. I would like to complicate that a little bit because uh, if you think about countries, they're not monolithic. They're not one thing. Countries don't have brains. Uh, countries don't think alike. So if, if in, in the United States, in my classroom, I ask my students, uh, maybe 30 students about about economic self-interest of the United States when it comes to a particular economic policy. And I, I get five different answers about what is in, in the U.S. self-interest, economic self-interest. And that actually holds for every country in the world. Now, when we're talking about China, of course, it's going through huge uh, economic change. It has been since the 1970s, since Nixon visited China, and that was sort of the opening. Um, now... When we talk about Chinese self-interest and uh, you know the currency swaps, their 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 uh, monetary uh, policy of um, keeping keeping the yuan cheap uh, vis-a-vis the dollar, etc. Now, uh, all this is not necessarily in the self-interest as we think of it, obviously, of uh, China as an entity. So, for example, in the last at least ten years, they've had increasing labor problems um, as uh, more and more people. 
are um, sort of um, displaced from the villages and they're forced to go and live in the cities. Uh, and, and these things, these transformations are happening almost overnight. And this is creating huge labor tensions. Um, there have been strikes. Uh, workers have tried to kill the managers. I'm sure there are infrastructure problems too, right? Yeah, I mean... The pace of of growth is just staggering. My 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 dad visits China every now and then, um, and uh, he's told me that within a space of six months, entire sort of uh, big city areas completely change. So it's a country constantly under construction, and and it's it's just staggering growth. And as Karen mentioned, um, that's actually a conscious strategy on the part of the party. Um, to keep um, to uh, to keep a certain tensions under wrap, as long as you can construct, provide jobs, uh, that's sort of the trade-off. America went through that back in the 1800s with the rapid expansion, but we did it almost, you know, in a vacuum because we didn't really have to deal too much with the rest of the world. Right now, China's going through that, but they have the rest of the world literally looking over their shoulders with their hands out waiting to be trading partners. Exactly, and and that's a very, very good point. You know, there's a, a very famous American uh, sociologist, economist, philosopher, Thorsten Veblen, who not many people read these days, unfortunately, um, who pointed out that um, th- there are some uh, th- there are some advantages and and actually Veblen and then there's another economist um, uh, Alexander Gershenkron who pointed out that there were advantages to being laggards because you know what people have already done and then you try to telescope a, a process which took other countries a hundred years into about 10 15 years that's what the Soviet Union did uh, if you think about what happened when they turned a predominantly agricultural country um, in the early 20th century into basically one of the most industrialized countries in the world by 1960s, at great cost. A now, starving that, industrialized. Well, <laughs> you know, it, it, was, it only came out later that it was at the cost of millions of other people, right? Yeah. But... But that, this that, is that, what that was, I'm that, saying. When you talk about country self-interest, there are always winners and losers within the country. As I, yeah. uh, I mean, th- this is not a monolithic uh, interest. Let, let me bring this up because I think it's my biggest challenge to the bipolar world idea. China, I think, looks really good on paper, but the fundamentals of the country are pretty terrible if you live there. You don't want to live there. A lot of people that have money escape because it's not a country the individual would necessarily want to be in. Uh, the pollution's horrible. It's not as accessible. It's not as free. If you're in the middle class and you're trying to climb rungs to get up higher, it's harder to get out. Same if you're at the bottom class, it's even harder. So I think that um, although on paper it looks good and looks like a balance, the future is dim for those that have the ability to travel and have the economics to get out. Let's bring our forecaster. Yeah, there, there you go, Karen. She this. reached out and grabbed that microphone. We're right. talking in, in kind of like this sterile way in some respects. And well, I think we can keep talking about persons here. So let's think about those, what, almost 2 billion people who live in China, right? I'm Personally, I've been to China. China is one of the main reasons that I started to study international relations. I was really interested in the comparisons I saw when I was there in college between my grandmother's hometown in Winfield, Kansas, and the outskirts of Beijing, China. The, like the climate was similar, and oh my goodness, people were living in a completely different way. Uh, but, you know, the pollution is terrible. And uh, the rights violations, you know, in terms of mobility and, and uh, uh, ability to speak your mind, those things are not what we would wish either. But, you know, um, today it isn't possible for people just to get up and leave a country. We see that every day with all of these migrants dying in the Mediterranean, right? We see it along the U.S. border. It isn't realistic to think that millions of Chinese are going to be able to leave China. And so the only option really for the world community as a whole, for for people around the world to be well off, is for China itself to develop internally. I, I agree with you. I think that would be the best case. But it, right now, it seems like you've you've got a country that's lost its ideological center, um, has started to adapt uh, Western ideas, or I just call it economic ideas, that are different than what it has on paper. And you know, as far as communism, and the 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 people that become successful. Um, I don't think necessarily have a sense of duty to their country. I guess that it holds true in the United States as well. But at least here, you can say what you want and not get in trouble. 
Well, I think sort of. that's one of the roles that the rising power of China is playing. It enables the regime to say to people, look, aren't you proud to be Chinese? And that's something that the British did during imperialism, too. We're it's gonna not the first time. We're going to come right back. 721-1290. Fascinating discussion. And by the way, this is the Montana World Affairs Council on the radio. We'll be here till 10 o'clock. And we're just getting started in this unique and very, very interesting conversation about economics in the world and how it relates in a stormy Missoula, Montana. We'll be right back. How to hire that kid. All right. <laughs> All right, we're back on Talkback, 721-1290. I want to get to our caller right away because we are at a limited time here. So, Marcus, good morning. You're on. Hello. Uh, first thing, I'd just like to thank you all for being here every morning and uh, doing what you do. It's, it's pretty amazing. It's our pleasure, sir. What's on your mind? Well, I was just hearing some comments about China and the United States, and I, you know, from a historical perspective, I wanted to bring in the thought that it wasn't all that long ago in the United States when we had things like McCarthyism, or even just a little further back. So in McCarthyism, you weren't really allowed to say what you wanted to say or do what you wanted to do. And then a little further back, let's look at the 1860s to 1880s, where uh, we had uh, kind of laissez-faire capitalism, you had, you know, children working in coal mines, and etc. Uh, so the United States hasn't always quite been the uh, beacon of light that we like to think. Well, every, every nation has its bumps in the road, but hopefully we right. work it out. But that change happened from within, the labor movement, yeah. uh, you know, human rights movement, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, because we didn't have the rest of the world looking over our shoulders like China does right now. Right. And I think that that will happen in China. Um, you know, you can also look at Japan. It was a very regimented and fairly rigid society even 10 to 20 years ago. And now you have a huge uh, youth culture movement. They're forgetting the ways of their past and moving forward in sort of a... Actually, actually you don't have that many youth? So yeah, that's the say, problem for China. Yeah, they don't have that many, but there is a youth movement among the youth that's yeah. sort of a counterculture movement. Right, I tell you and, what, I, uh, let's, I believe that's going to happen in China as well. Let's, let's have our guests address that. So, uh, so Obashaka, go ahead, John. Uh, uh, you know, the, uh, Marcus made a, uh, one very good point. There were other good points, too, but one particularly good point. <laughs> okay. Uh, that... Um, uh, that in the United States, uh, you know, the labor movement happened, labor conditioned, conditions improved over 60, 100 years, right? And um, like I mentioned, in China that and countries like China, those processes are being telescoped in a very, very short period of time. Mm -hmm. Now, the U.S. has an unusually uh, violent labor history in the 19th century. I mean, people in Montana should know, and people in Colorado, Montana, mm -hmm. they very well are aware of the labor history, how violent the struggle was and so on. But, um, you know, over time, like in a piecemeal fashion, like, like you pointed out, that um, there wasn't this competitive pressure. Though, though on the other hand, um, people in Europe, especially in England, would uh, write about how brutal the, uh, the U.S. government was towards its own labor force and so on and so forth. And, you know, the Europeans would shake their heads and say, oh, those violent Americans and so on. This is like late 19th century, too. So that was a very good point that Marcus made, that um, every country in the world has gone through, every country that has industrialized has gone through a similar process, except... Is that, does it would be natural growing pains? I don't think it's... When we talk about human beings in this sense, I'm getting a little philosophical here. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't use the word natural because we consciously act on societies. Some people gain, some people lose. It wasn't natural for the, for the peasants who were thrown out of their lands um, in England and forced to go and work um, in London. It wasn't natural for them. It was very natural for the firm owners who wanted that right, to happen. Right, okay. and, but that happened way more gradually in countries like the United States and England. And what we are seeing in China is all that mm. being uh, compressed in a very, very short period. Just mm. imagine that, 30, 40 years, what took Europe, the process in Europe, industrialization the process of industrialization of, in Europe was about 150 years, right? And, and that's happened, that happened in Soviet Union in about 30, 40 years. It's happening in China now very, very quickly. Okay, hang, hang, hang on to that thought. Surely, I'm going to ask you to hold, if you, if you wouldn't mind. We have to take our top-of-the-hour break. Uh, we have two lines open. 721-1290 is our number. Obishek Chatterjee, along with Karen Adams, uh, 
We're talking about political science and the economy of the world. We're solving it all right here <laughs> within the next <laughs> within the next hour. Boy, we have a job cut out for us. We're going to come right back after the top of the hour break on the KGVO. Stay with us. We are back. The Montana World Affairs Council on the radio with just a house full of people, and we have been chatting it up, so to speak, uh, during during the break, uh, discussing. We've already solved most of the world's problems, but there are some that are left. But <laughs> I promised we'd get Shirley on right away after the break. She's been waiting a very, very long time. Shirley, first of all, thanks for holding. You are on with Bob and Karen and Obashek. Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> I appreciate your call, uh, your guest this morning. <clears throat> My question is, what would happen to the U.S. dollar if the Chinese yuan was recognized as a reserve currency by the IMF? Okay. Either one of you want to grab that. Go ahead. Over well, well, the IMF technically doesn't uh, recognize currencies like that. Um, recognition, there's no sort of formal forum where people get together and say, okay, this is the reserve currency. It's just... It just so happened that after World War II, there was a short period where the world was on um, gold standard for a while. And then uh, after, uh, after the Vietnam War, um, Nixon took the U.S. off gold standard, and so dollar became the uh, reserve currency. Uh, that's sort of the short version of the story. But now there are for, se- aren't there seven reserve currencies? Uh, no, the, the dollar is, I mean... The at the IMF, there are, but um, but most countries still uh, hold the dollar. And I don't think that uh, the yuan or any other currency is going to quickly re- replace the dollar for the following reason. Um, the U.S. Uh, still remains the sole superpower. I mean, we can talk more about this. Um, and two... Uh, the other option for a while was um, the euro, but you know, given what has happened in the last uh, year and a half, two years, that's uh, rapidly sort of not becoming an option anymore. The Chinese would like the yuan to become uh, a reserve currency like you imply, but there are so many hurdles. For example, Japan is not going to agree to it, neither is India. None of China's neighbors are going to agree to it. Um, China doesn't have a good relationship with Vietnam, India, um, Japan, South Korea, all these countries. None of them will agree to have the yuan as a reserve currency. Okay. Uh, Bob, you wanted to comment on that too, right? You know, there's something I've said several times too. These things are very fluid. They will ebb and flow. But as a nation, what you do to get your fiscal house in order, what you do to make sure that you have an entrepreneurial environment— your regulatory and, you know, your regulations, your political uh, issues, that the strongest thing you can do for yourself is to make sure that you're trying to fire on all cylinders. And, and that's not an easy task, but the world is going to change constantly. So take care of your own house first. Okay, Shirley, thanks for the call. We appreciate it. Let's get Steve on. Steve, good morning. You're on with our guests. Go ahead. Oh, I guess not. Thanks for calling, Steve. <laughs> Better luck next time. All right. I, I had something I wanted to interject into the conversation. We we're talking about the bipolar world. Do you see a future with more poles? What yes. about India, things like that? And, and, and how will that balance out? I know, uh, what's his name? Fareed Zachariah talks about the rise of the rest mm-hmm. and kind of imagines this beautiful plateau in the future where everybody's kind of participating at the same level. What do you see? Well, I don't think we'll ever be to a place where everybody's participating at the same level. I mean, there's 193 countries in the world, and there are vast power differentials between them. But I do think that by the middle of the century, there will be more than a couple of great powers. So, and China's the, I mean, India is the most likely prospect. India, is, as Obishay can talk about, um, is rising quickly with the size of its economy and the, the demography of its population is likely to be a bigger economy than China's even by the middle of the century. And China will surpass the U.S. by then. Uh, Brazil is also a good possibility uh, for a, a substantial uh, global power. 
But it's going to take a while for all of that to happen. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a bit like a, having a free market, right? It's, it's nice for people worldwide to have a lot of different options. And so even to Shirley's question a minute ago about a reserve currency, I think it's good for there to be competition uh, internationally between countries because it creates uh, more, more uh, efficiency in some way. Um, it also creates inefficiency you know, in terms of military spending and military elements of competition. But I think overall, it's a good thing for there to be more uh, big players than just one or two. In the past, humanities has solved <clears throat> conflicts between multipolar world uh, views uh, with war. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's usually an ingredient in the, in the resolution. Are you optimistic that we'll be able to do it differently in the future? Yeah, no, we have, you we noticed have I've, I've said, I'm not only forecasting, I'm actually calling that China has risen to great power status. And you notice they've done that without a war. That's actually one of the reasons that this is a contentious thesis, because usually great powers rise as they kill off somebody else. But with nuclear weapons, it's so dangerous for great powers to uh, come into to their status through war that I think the competition is going to continue to be displaced. It, but got- that doesn't mean we aren't going to have a lot of military parades yeah. and well, you it's know, gotta, swaggering. It's, it's uh, got to be done a lot more creatively. That's right. right. Yeah. yeah. So, mm-hmm. so, Karen, in terms of when you were looking at your forecasting, economic integration is conceptually and in many cases in reality lends itself to better cooperation where we have interests that you know overlaps. If I was to look at a region and say where the possibility of a conflict nuclear would exist would be in that band along the Middle East. Did you look at anything in that area in terms of your forecasting as far as what would be an area strategically that has the greatest potential for historically what we look at as you know, military conflict con- for a nuclear well, conflict? Well, I think there's a difference between nuclear conflict and military conflict. Yeah. It isn't predicting much, Bob, to say that the Middle East is going to have war. <laughs> I know that. You know, I think it's going to rain today, guys. Well, so it's it's raining 100% of chance of rain today. <laughs> but but, but, in, terms of the, but yeah. in terms of the strategic and political environment that exists in this area yeah. relative to what you're just describing. Right, and that's a legacy of historical great power politics, right? The British, the French, they all built those countries with these divisions that are continuing to bother everybody today. And, of course, the place is endowed with this resource that everybody runs their economies on. So the trick is going to be alternative fuels. That's when the Middle East stops being the place where everybody is competing. That's so, way down the tell road. Tell you what, we're, we're up against a break, and we have callers. We have Steve. Steve is back. We have managed to uh, – rest- uh, go ahead, John. Oh, we all right? Oh, we need to give away some coffee. We need to give away some free coffee. Yeah, we, we have we, one we, line open, and I don't think it's going to be open for very long. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we've got the Rocket Coffee giveaway. we got toast, your choice of spreads. All you have to do is call 721-1290. Don't have to predict the future. Uh, <laughs> You don't even have to know that there will be another war in the Middle East, or, or the, that it's raining. Or that it's for raining. crying out yeah, loud! Really, yeah. All it's you have to do is now, call. Though, the sun <laughs> shining. <laughs> seven <Wrong>. two <laughs> seven two one twelve ninety. Here's Obachek raining on our rain parade. Uh, that number again: seven two one twelve ninety. First caller gets the coffee. Here we go. We'll be right back. <laughs> We're back on Talkback. 721-1290 is our number, and we do have a winner. Uh, it's, That's right. It's the birthday girl. It's the birthday girl, Sue Orr, who's also wanting to uh, chime in on the conversation later. So we'll we'll talk to her in a little bit. But yeah, Sue won coffee at the Rocket Coffee Stand, which is in the Garden City Garden Supply. So okay, check it out. Let's uh, let, let's get right to the phones. And uh, I, I'm apologizing to Steve. I'm not sure if I cut you off or it was just Ma Bell or whatever. But uh, Steve, you're on. Go ahead. Well, thanks. I think the rain washed away my cell signal. Ah. But uh, my question is, the, through the choices that China has made, especially the single uh, child philosophy that they had, there's going to be a large number of unmarried men, and uh, the problems that those are going to cause for China, combined with China's lack of natural resources as Russia depopulates, is Russia going to look towards Siberia as possible source of resources? and possibly toward Vietnam or Laos, but of course for uh, feminine needs of unmarried men. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's let him answer that question. So, uh, well, go ahead. I would say that's a big factor in the Russia-China relationship. Russia is resource-rich, and as it expands into the Arctic, as the Arctic melts, it's going to be an even nicer trading partner for China for those raw materials that China needs. So I think China's thinking big on the, on the seller end. Karen, explain a little bit. You said that if, you know, Arctic is melting, there's a very significant trade scenario that kind of gets unleashed 
if some of these sea lanes open. Would you right. expand a little bit about so what that actually means? So it's good news and bad news. Bad right. news for the environment, good news for the economy. Well, in some ways, it's good news for the environment because it's a lot shorter to go through the Arctic over to Asia from, right. say, Canada or the western United States than it is to go through the traditional trade routes. So Canada and the U.S. are very eager to get on this this uh, opening as well. So the Arctic is going to be an interesting place, not only for resource extraction, but also for new territorial claims and for new um, – you know, new uh, new trade routes and all of the excitement that goes along with that. Uh, both China and Russia suffer from a problem, and that is that people don't make babies anymore. It, there's a difficulty. There's a there's kind of a climax, if you will, of the number of people in the area. That's happening really soon. Uh, Bob apparently has a re projections report from the Pew Research uh, study on on global population. I'm curious how you feel that would affect in your predictions and mm -hmm. forecasting. Mm -hmm. And my basic question is, when do you see China peaking, if it will, um, as far as a competitor with the United States on the, the well, I, That's a forecasting question I would not make. I would not take on. That's where I go close to 50-50. Think about all of the choices. But on your show, John, I will, <laughs> I will buck up and answer this question. No, I've learned. <laughs> And show you the wounds from taking on questions like that. Um, you know, that depends on human choices, and it depends on all sorts of things that are very hard to predict about, you know, well, just, new industries and weather just, patterns. But and just all sorts imagine, of just imagine if China had unbridled population growth. Well, but you know, listen, look at what John's setting up here. So they're damned one way, they're damned the other, right? They right. don't, they have so many people, they can't give them human rights and high living standards, or they have so few people that they can't compete with the U.S. That part of John's argument. Just throwing that out. Well, but, but really, that's kind of a funny thing, right? I mean, the the more that the Chinese population um, slows, the easier it will be to provide for their for their well being for a while. And, yeah, but um, we've seen in in Europe, for example, in Italy, in France, birth rates had fallen for a while. The state rearranges its tax policies. All of a sudden, there are young families all over the place. So those There's are things that can be periods. adjusted, you know, there with with government periods, policies yeah. and with with rising incomes, people will feel secure about having families again. It's not, I think, that quick to, and easily to redeem, especially for, uh, I'm just using Japan as a country I know and lived in. They've been trying to redeem themselves from the same scenario for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Lots of public and pol political pressure on making kids, and it doesn't seem to be moving the curve much at all. And I think that, I mean, culturally, there are a lot of similarities between China and Japan. I think it would probably undergo some of the same pressures. Well, I don't know. Do you have an opinion about that, Obishik? Well, well, in case of Japan, uh, I mean, uh, as Karen said, I think the uh, uh, where you start from the the economic situation each country started from is very different. In Japan, uh, there was a whole social system set up that was predicated on the assumption that women, after they got married, and they decided to have kids, they would quit their job and just sit at home and the men would work. And that that system is has been slowly unraveling in the 90s and 2000s, as you know. Um, in China, I think it's very different. Um, what has happened since, since the 70s in one way is um, a cut in a lot of social security that used to exist under uh, under the... The, before they uh, underwent sort of the economic liberalization process in the late 70s. So if you look at the data on the number of doctors uh, per thousand and availability of medical care, medical insurance, the government has actually cut all those things since the 70s and 80s, hoping, as Karen said, that the growth rates would be fast enough to more than make up for the loss of social, secu uh, social safety net. Now, we don't know, I, I, I certainly don't know enough to predict what's going to happen. I, I don't have the data right now, I, I don't know. Uh, but uh, the situation is very different in Japan. Well, when we come back from the break, I want you to talk about India a little bit, because they're a young, growing population, but there's intense political issues that result from these swings in aging or increasing 
populations in terms of the challenges that they have to meet. Dave, we're going to talk about that. Plus, we have Dave. Uh, I promised to get Dave on right after the break. We'll do that, and we'll continue. We also have two lines open if you'd like to get into this fascinating discussion about world economics, population growth, all sorts of things, 721-1290. We'll be right back. Thanks for joining us on Talk Back. Here it is Wednesday. We have a house full of guests, basically, and uh, hopefully we need water. We're good. We get, everybody's got everything they need. Let's get uh, to the phone and talk with Dave. Dave, you're on with Obishak and Karen and Bob and John and Peter and uh, a cast of thousands. <laughs> and Cluck the Wonder Hen. Now, go ahead. Good, good morning. Um, <laughs> you know, you talk about free trade. Uh, free trade doesn't necessarily prevent big wars. So I'll give you an example of uh, Hitler's Germany and the Soviet Union, they had lots of free trade, but didn't prevent them from going to war. Uh, well, you also had a Hitler. <laughs> well, there's lots of Hitlers out there. Okay. But right. uh, as far as, as uh, going to war, Hitler assumed, uh, thought that Russia or the Soviet Union was weak. That's what started the war. If, if the United States wants to prevent a big war, it has to be strong. That's what prevents big wars. And if, if we de- in, in, de-industrialize our country, we'll become a weak country in the eyes of China. And that could lead to a war. Don't you think you just contradicted yourself by saying it wasn't just about Hitler and saying that Hit- they went into Russia because Hitler thought Russia was weak? Right. Okay. The, yeah, r- r- they, Hitler thought it would be easy. They had free trade going, and Hitler thought the Soviet Union could be wiped out real quickly. They, they weren't as weak as... Hitler thought they were. But if the United States wants to prevent a big war, they have to be strong, and, and that means economically strong. And de industrializing the United States will not make us strong. Okay, let's let our uh, guests address that. So um, go ahead, Karen. Well, I agree that free trade doesn't prevent wars. In fact, an even better example, Dave, is that before World War I, the UK and Germany were each other's largest trading partners. And there are many people who thought that World War I would never happen because it wasn't in either of their interests. But Germany was a rising power and really wanted to have the respect and territorial um, footprint that went along with that. And the British, of course, had taken over everything, and so they had to fight about it. The good news is that um, both the U.S. and China and a number of other countries have nuclear weapons, and so it makes any kind of conflict like that, um, hopefully, just something in the rearview mirror. I love that statement. The good news is they all have nuclear weapons. You may not know this, but uh, Karen's advisor in graduate school uh, made a very famous argument uh, to that effect. Who was your advisor? Uh, uh, Kenneth Waltz, who was, uh, who's a very, very famous, one, one of the founders of American neorealism uh, in and IR. He, he said more may be better. More yeah. nuclear weapon yeah. states may be better. Mad. That yeah. seems to be mm-hmm. proven mutually, true in many ways. Mutually, is. Is, I mean, mutually just, assured you know, destruction. The Cold War was cold because the U.S. and Soviet Union had nuclear weapons, in spite of the fact that they, had, they could have fought World War II all over again, even worse with the conventional weapons they had. Mm-hmm. But the deterrent power of nuclear weapons was really strong. And um, we've seen that with India and Pakistan, right? right. Um, they've had minor wars, but because they both have nuclear weapons, there's a lot of caution around expanding those wars. So let's give Iran a nuke. We'll be good. Well, right? you know. Yeah? Come on. That's what, let's do that's it. what Ken Waltz said. <laughs> Did he? Yeah. He so said, I, I'm you know, curious. things would settle down in the Middle East if, if uh, Iran would have nuclear weapons. Mm-hmm. You notice I'm not, I'm not forecasting You're saying that. he said that. Yeah. Well, Are I mean, you saying that Karen also agrees with him? Well, no. See, th- here's the deal. I think it, it's, it, it, it makes a perverse get, logic, though. It does make, yeah, and, and in fact, I think you can already see the effects of Iran being so close to nuclear weapons. I mean, do we really want to bomb Iran when they could quickly turn around and, and turn their all their close capability into an actual weapon to retaliate? Mm. There's already some deterrence uh, operating there. So I think the bigger picture is maybe a little bit easier, and that is to say, with, regardless of what we do, countries that feel insecure are probably going to go ahead and get nuclear weapons. And I do think that that dampens down military conflict on, on, that, that involves them. I would love to talk about nuclear weapons in Iran, but one of the things I know our callers wanted me to talk about in this week, and I think this is my best chance to do it, is about this trade deal that's been debated at the United States. Um, I know Obashek somewhat of a pro on this. Uh, you actually got to go into the secret room and read the script, I assume, right? <laughs> no? <laughs> no, I, 
I was trying to divine. Okay, good. Divine That's the deal. We got. we got a forecaster and a diviner. So yeah. we're set. I, I want to know what you know about this <laughs> deal. And uh, and I, I think the most interesting thing that I've been able to take away from it is the the people that are aligned against the deal. I think watching the way that the Senate uh, moved and, you know, pulling parts of like the Tea Party right and yep. the... Uh, the left progressive left together against the trade deal was interesting to the, watch. The strangest of bedfellows. And so I'd like to see uh, I'd like to see your analysis on it. Well, if you looked at the actual uh, votes from uh, yesterday or something, uh, you would see that there was exactly one Republican senator who voted um, against uh, the Cloyder motion. Right. Could, could you please, for the audience purposes, talk about what, what is this trade deal yeah. uh, that so, we're describing? Um, Give the acronym so, and what this is about. So we're we're assuming called, everybody knows. So it, it's called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's a sort of, I mean, the, the details are sort of murky because uh, the president doesn't want it uh, to be public because he doesn't, he wants one vote in favor or against the deal. He doesn't want, he thinks... Too many cooks will spoil the broth. Of course, there are other considerations. Um, so uh, the, I'm 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 grossly oversimplifying this. A gross oversimplification may be a redundancy, but I'm still doing it. Um, <laughs> but um, it's sort of like a NAFTA for think back to NAFTA for uh, between Southeast Asia and um, the United States. Now I think that it's uh, and and in in fact. You know, it has come out in various ways that this is actually directed against China. Um, the United States uh, wants to arrest the economic might of China in the Southeast Asian region. And that is one big motivation. The motivation is security, actually, something that Karen would uh, would better speak to. But uh, the motivation is um, to use uh, the these economic relations to balance China in the Pacific region. Now, remember what I said about economic interests not being monolithic of all countries? There are winners and losers. So if you looked at the vote in Senate, there was exactly one Republican who was against the deal, let's say, and there was exactly one Democrat that voted in favor, right? So in fact, the mainstream, the sort of the uh, mainstream of the Republican Party is all in favor of this because. Uh, there's the sectors they're supported by, the businesses that are going to, I'm guessing, uh, gain from this deal, want this deal to go through. On the other hand, I think labor unions are opposed to it, um, and that's one big sort of still rapidly waning part of the Democratic Party. Mm-hmm. And and there are all kinds of other considerations that I can go into. Okay, we're up against a break. So uh, go ahead, John. You want to make a point? No, no. I'd love to just go back into that after the okay, break. We're going to do that. Also, Alan is waiting, and we have two lines open. This is great. We still have a half an hour left to go. 721-1290. We'll be right back. 721-1290. Now right in the middle of a uh, world-changing conversation, ladies and gentlemen. John King's over there. Bob Seidenschwartz. Also joining us in studio, we have Karen Adams, the uh, prophetess. As we have dubbed her now, and Obashek Chatterjee, the, the um, what was the word you used? The diviner. He's the diviner. Yes, the diviner. Okay. The divine, <laughs> diviner. Um, before we get to callers, I have one more follow-up question, because although you had mentioned labor unions as the reason behind a lot of the left's opposition or the Democrat opposition to this particular trade deal, although there is a tradition of a opposition to trade deals from the Democratic Party, um, one of the things that gets talked about the most is the way that it will affect America's laws um, and that there's a potential that other nations will be able to override, for example, our environmental laws and cause degradation if they so will and we'll lose. We're giving up our sovereignty and things like this. How much of this do you think is just polemic and uh, people trying to rouse up the base? And how much of it is, do you think is true? I think there is something to that. Um, so, for example, in... Uh, if you look at NAFTA, uh, one of the, um, again, I'm simplifying a bit, uh, one of the particular um, sort of um, deals with that was that um, every government had to give national treatment to industries, even if they were from a foreign country. So, for example, if an American corporation opened a, a plant in Mexico, 
the Mexican government could not tax it differently than it taxed its own um, uh, own companies, and um, and vice versa, right? And vice versa. Right. But at that point, you know, because the U.S. and Canada, to a certain extent, had so much industrial superiority over Mexico, um, we really, I mean. When I say we, I mean uh, the people involved in the deal didn't really care. I think there's something uh, like that going on with this deal also. Um, I think the calculation on the part of the Obama administration and and people who support this deal is that, well, we we have these, um, we have industrial superiority. And in a way, um, this this idea about environmental protections and overriding local laws, it's going to work more in our favor than in their favor. Um, and so their calculation is that our um, sectors, our firms are going to come out the winners. Now, um, now that's not to say that uh, the, 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 the other question, the uh, other thing is not going to happen. There are going to be losers. Well, and, and in context of that, all countries, again, from my perspective, are acting in their national interest. So he's framing this in terms of what this does for American business, but also from an administrative standpoint and ideologically, is this a directive that you see in terms of this globalization that's been taking place will continue to accelerate? We're going to have a lot more people on the planet. So how much, if at all, does that come into the equation in terms of these type of treaties? Or is it really business directed? Well, I, I think you cannot uh, ignore the role of business here. I, I mean, it might have been the brainchild, uh, Obama's brainchild or the administration's brainchild. But if you don't get the cooperation of business, you don't have it. And to get the cooperation of business, you have to uh, convince them that it's in in their interest to go along with this deal, even if the biz- business is not the first mover. And what are the greatest market opportunities in terms of the next 50 years? It's the Asian market. Exactly. So, so exactly. you have to look at where the business development and economic activity is going to be at its greatest. All right, let's uh, play talk show and get a caller in. <laughs> All right, Alan, thanks for holding and your patience. You're on. Go ahead. Yeah, good morning. I would like to follow up a little bit on Dave's comment about war. Uh, something extremely interesting happened earlier this month. There was a military parade in Red Square, very reminiscent to the old May Day parades that used to go on when the Soviet Union existed. With all the missiles and everything, right? Yes, and yeah. they introduced a new tank. But one of the things that really made it interesting was the fact that the Chinese premier was there and that Chinese soldiers participated in this parade. Ooh. This, this is really scary, and it seems to me that China and Russia are working together to try and isolate us, not only from a military, but from an economic situation. And both China and Russia have been spending large amounts of money to improve, upgrade, and increase their militaries. At the same time, the United States is cutting back on building its military and its new weapons. And I want one more comment on uh, nuclear weapons. This, this idea that nuclear weapons deter is certainly true, but only if you have the willpower to use them. The United States quit testing underground nuclear weapons in September of 1992. I was at the Nevada test site at the time. We have not conducted a underground test, nor have we built a new nuclear weapon in the last 23 years. Most of our nuclear weapons come out of the 70s, and I would sincerely like to see us pull one or two out of stock and put it underground and see if it goes bang. Okay. Thanks, Alan. Uh, so I'm sure the warranty is well off, that the, some of those. Oh, well, actually, I'm pretty <laughs> confident about this one. I think it would still go bang. And, I, you know, there's a lot of other ways to te- do tests now. There's a lot of simulation testing that the U.S. military is still doing down in New Mexico, for example. I have a physicist friend who's involved in that. So I'm confident that our nukes are still powerful, 
And uh, I, I think that they still do a fine job of deterring. The U.S. has uh, the largest military budget in the world. We spend five times more than China still, and we're spending more and more every year. So I'm not really worried about the U.S. being able to uh, defend uh, U.S. interests internationally. But I do agree, Alan, that it's very interesting to watch the Russian and Chinese military cooperation. Uh, this year, um, uh, this week, the, US, the Russians and Chinese are exercising uh, in the Mediterranean, and they just finished a small exercise in the Black Sea. Both of those are really significant signals that they intend to uh, stand up for what they believe is in their interest, while the U.S. does so as well. So we're in a new era. It's an interesting thing. But, but I don't think that war is inevitable in this situation between the major powers. Hey, the dance continues. We're going to continue. Catherine and Craig will get your calls on here in a moment. And we have a line open, 721-1290. We'll be right back. All right, we're back on TalkBack. 721-1290 is the number. All right, now let's get right back to the phones. And Catherine has been waiting very patiently. Catherine, you're on with our guests. Go ahead. Uh, good morning. Martin Ford, who's a Silicon Valley con computer programmer, uh, has just written a book uh, titled The Lights in the Tunnel. I don't know if you've ever if you've run across that. Uh, this explores the economic and societal implica implications of an increasingly automated world, one aspect of which is a, a global human labor wage that will tend towards a mean with little variation. Another one is global uh, immigration increasing and a decreased national boundaries, uh, continual creative destruction of human professions, an example of which uh, came out in the news today, which is anesthesiologists. Right and medical technology um, that can be automated. Uh, so there'll be a continual need for skill upgrades to remain viable. His contention is that this uh, coming um, economic, societal, and, and governance dislocation will lead to a massive upheaval in the near future. Um, so I was wondering how you would see that. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Catherine. Appreciate the call. So either one of you, Karen or Abhishek, go ahead. Overcheck. Uh, it's, um, it's all well, yours. Well, um, the the global wage. Uh, you mean? Well, you know, it's interesting because uh, at the dawn of neoclassical economics, um, if when people started creating economic models, state boundaries did not factor into the economic models. That's why you get equilibrium wages and equilibrium everything. In fact. Um, you go back to the 19th century, uh, uh, Ricardo, David Ricardo's models of free trade, etc., do not assume um, national borders or states or countries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's why they were considered problematic. Now, so uh, this is, it, there's nothing new about this imagination, let me put it this way. Um, this imagination has been with human beings for about at least written down form in two, for 200 years that there will be one global wage. In fact, again, you go back to classical economics models, uh, you can prove a theorem showing that there will be one global wage um, given, you know, you, you can introduce other assumptions into these models um, and, and find out what, how the implications change as you change certain assumptions. So uh, this is not, certainly not new uh, people have been thinking in these terms for about, you know, like I said, 200 years. But um, what, is, um, what is interesting to me is that how long it has taken uh, for wages uh, to, uh, for, for even interest rates in, in certain markets uh, to harmonize. Um, so, by de so this implies that there are still... I don't want to use, you know, for various reasons, I don't want to go in here. I don't like that vocabulary. But um, there are still inefficiencies that are causing interest rates not to harmonize and, and et cetera. So I don't think um, whatever this gentleman writes, uh, Martin Ford, I, I don't think it's going to happen in, in, in the next uh, 50, 60 years if we're still alive. I mean, if we don't destroy the planet, that is. and the and. The other thing war doesn't is, break out. Is, the other thing is is that the assumption that that increased technology is going to be bad for humanity, right. when when oftentimes it's the increased technology that's made life better for uh, for individuals, and we we eventually find other things to do 
besides, you know, mining our own coal rather than using machines or whatever. Uh, and I realize that's a rather simplistic way of looking at it. But, but, but is that right? Or, or, or are we looking too, too uh, uh, are we demonizing the whole mechanistic world too much? Well, um, I, I think historically you're right because, you know, if you go back to the time of, again, uh, you know, history is very important. Uh, when Thomas Malthus was writing about the problem of population, he did not factor in productivity right. due to technological right. developments. And um, and for uh, the best part of 200 years, that's what, I mean, it's, it, I mean, imagine yourself being, um, in in London in the 1830s, it's a stink hole. I would have used stronger words, but um, <laughs> but and then no one would have uh, n- no one would have imagined uh, that that city could support so many people. But you're right, technological developments. But I want to caution that this should not become a, a sort of a matter of faith that technology is always going to rescue us. Maybe there's a technological limit. I mean, the world is not an infinite resource, Mm -hmm. right? And um, so we don't know what the limits to technology are. Maybe it's, um, you know, um, so we talk about renewable energy as the next horizon and so on. We'll see incentives are not quite aligned for that to happen very quickly. Hey, but. We're, we're up against this a, a one-minute break, and we do have Craig, who still wants to get his question in, and only about eight minutes left in the program. And I, I think we can just tell Rush to take a hike, and we'll just stay here until <laughs> 1 o'clock. No, I'm just kidding. We're, we'll be right back after this one-minute timeout. And uh, everybody's dancing. All right, it's Dance Party USA! Oh, no, I'm just kidding. All right. <laughs> <laughs> We're having way too much fun on this show. All right, uh, Craig, thanks for holding your on talk back. Go ahead, sir. Great tune. Thank you. So, uh, anyways, all this from the most open administration ever. We haven't heard from Nancy Pelosi yet that you have to pass the bill to know what's in it. You know. Okay. So, do you have a question for our guest? No, that's it. Okay. <laughs> and a shout out to to Carla and Dave Wiegand. Okay. Or Car- Carla and Alfalfa. Good day. <laughs> what was that all about? Uh, I, I am curious. That I think that the, the even for, let's say me, I'm a big free trade guy. I like trade. I think it benefits most humanity. I am uh, skeptical about this particular administration. So when I have a free trade deal that's completely hidden from view, I'm, I'm like torn. I, I don't know what to think. It's tough for me. Um, I, I'm curious. You know, uh, w- with people like uh, our, our last caller also, you know, if you can't read it, what, what's with all the, the, the hiding and the secrecy? I would like to know what you think the reason is. Well, I, I think the reason is, I think, very simple. Um, he, he thinks that if it's publicized and everyone gets to read it, people will find out who the losers are. And the losers are not going to like that they're the losers. And so they're going to lobby their Congress people, their senators, and try to explain to them that, look, this deal is not in our interest. Remember, again, national interest is not national. I mean, it's not everyone doesn't think right. it's the same national interest. I think so. The, 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 you're, uh, and I, I'm, I personally think that it's, it's not a good idea to, um, to do these trade deals in secret. And, and you know, in a sense, the word free trade is somewhat of a misnomer. Mm -hmm. In many ways, these become investors' rights agreements. So intra-investor agreements. Investors from Southeast Asia agreeing to certain terms with investors in the United States. Do you think this is the capstone of what was referred to as the pivot to Asia that started four or five years ago, was supposed to take the United States towards Asia, uh, that sort of thing? I know we talked about this last time a little bit, Karen. Right. Well, you know... (laughs) If uh, China's rising, then it's we're a little behind the time in thinking all we need to do is pivot to Asia, right? Because what that means is China's going to be a world player. And we see that this week. The you don't say rising, is, you say has risen. That's right. He that's has right. risen. But, you know, it's a process. It's, you know, yeah. it's a continuing process. This week, the premier of China is headed down to Latin America to conduct some trade deals and enter into some military agreements. And you know what? He's allowed to do that. That's right. <laughs> so, you know, the pivot to Asia is pretty yesterday. But this trade agreement is very important in maintaining U.S. Um, alliances in Asia, which are important to be able to continue to compete with China. Now, I've been thinking about this. To what extent... 
would I support the particulars of the TPP and so forth? I think it's really important for China, I mean, for the U.S. to have a trade agreement and other agreements with countries around China to help them maintain their independence and to help us maintain our prosperity. Uh, but the details, you know, of these things are always hidden. I, are we kvetching because we don't know the details of the Iran agreement? No. Did we, you know, is this any different from the way NAFTA was negotiated? No. This is how diplomacy works. And um, there's going to be two stages of this. There's the Senate having the chance to pass TPA, which is the Trade Promotion Authority that gives the administration the ability to negotiate, knowing that the Senate will have an up or down vote later, and then the the agreement will be published. It will be available for three months for debate, and then the Senate will have the up or down vote. I want to know, Karen, you're in the Senate. Do you give the power of the ability, uh, President, the ability to fast track it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I no? would. Oh, definitely, okay. because I know that I will have a chance to do an up or down vote later on, and and my constituents will see the whole, all the details of the agreement. <laughs> so, is, so all the all the fuss about this, do you think it's much ado about nothing? Well, it's not unusual. I mean, there's always a fuss like this okay. around a diplomatic agreement, especially a trade agreement with okay. a lot of winners and losers. And don't these things evolve over time, too? They're not just static in terms of this is what it is today and it always will be. Or is that not the case? I'm sorry. I, didn't, uh, the, I don't think I heard your question. Um, these things evolve over time. They're, the, not, they're the not just the agreements. Or are they written oh, well, in stone? But yeah. my assumption is they evolve to kind of accommodate changes within global climate. Well, yeah, I mean, think about the complexity of this negotiation. There's, you know, 100 senators, there's um, 20 countries involved in the negotiation, each with their own population. It's a huge and complex operation. And so the, the administration has to play to two audiences. It has to reassure the U.S. that this is going to be in broadly America's interest, and it has to reassure its negotiating partners that this is going to be a good deal for them, even though Historically, trade deals have mostly benefited the U.S. So it's complicated. So is this an all-or-nothing deal? I mean, it, it either take the whole deal or the whole thing gets, gets scrapped, or is it possible yeah, to... That, no, that's the way it's being negotiated. And okay. that's the way these trade deals have to work, because there's so many players. Right. So this thing's been being negotiated for, what, six, seven years, right? And they're getting down to the final lines, and, and it's they will... the. Once TPA passes, then the um, TPP uh, countries will will decide what is the final text of the agreement. Then it will be all of their business to try to get their countries to ratify it as it is. So it's up or down. Okay, we have about a minute left in the in the program. And Dave, I wish we had time to get your your call, and I'm so sorry. Uh, but anyway, so as as you guys move forward, if folks want to get more information about what you folks do and to learn about uh, some of the things that you're doing, what can we read? What where can we go? Well, uh, you can follow me on Twitter for heaven's sake. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Google Google the, Karen Ruth Adams, the University of Montana. The, the You'll see me there. I don't tweet very often, but oh, I tweet good when I tweet. <laughs> Obi Shake, where can they find you? Well, I'm. I don't have much of a presence. I'm. It's it's strange, but. Uh, I, I I used to have a Facebook account, I think. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of a, like... F you have an email address. I do have an email address, okay, yes. Go for uh, it. I have... Uh, uh, so my first name dot my last name at umontana.edu. If you go to the political science department website... There you go. Uh, ...at the University of Montana, you should be able to see my smiling visage. And, because, and we would spend the rest of the morning spelling your name. So, anyway, yeah. Because, anyway, go ahead, Bob. Let's let's wrap up. I just want to get these guys back. <laughs> uh, yeah. We just got your service. We never even talked about India, so we will have you back to have yeah. that discussion, too. All right. Yeah. Thank you, guys. And what's coming up on tomorrow's fabulous program, John? Uh, well, uh, I just uh, read an interesting article in the Wall Street Journal by uh, uh, Forgot Roth is her last name. Uh, she's been on before. She's going to talk about the effect of this economy on the graduating class. All right, super. That's going to do it for, uh, for Talk Back. Thanks for, to all of our guests and all of our callers, and we'll see you tomorrow.